So back in 1984, today's feature band was teetering on the brink of extinction. I mean, after crushing it with four straight landmark LPs in the 70s, everything went sideways to start the 80s. Uh, band members quit, uh, three albums failed to deliver at all, and the record company actually kicked them to the curb. And word on the street was they had lost their mojo. In fact, five labels, five in a row, took a hard pass on these iconic rockers. They started to wonder if their career was over. And then miraculously, they were given one last chance, but they had to make the best of it. They had arguably the greatest female voice ever to deliver these songs, but their first number one, their comeback, came from the backup singer slash guitarist, and she got a distinct vocal performance because, get this, she was sick. In fact, she tried to re-record when she got better, and it just wasn't the same. Find out how this band pulled off a miracle comeback, made it in the 80s, with interviews, next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you have big hair, or you remember big hair in the 80s, you're gonna love this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, hit the red button, click the bell so you always know when our latest features come out, our interviews, we've got some great ones coming up. Also, check us out on Patreon. You can become a, an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. And also, check out our merch below. Uh, support us there. So today, we're covering a song by definitely one of the most influential bands in the 70s and 80s and beyond, fronted by two of the most well-known names in rock, the legendary sisters, I'm talking about Anna and Nancy Wilson, of Heart. The song, the massively successful These Dreams from their 1985 comeback self-titled album. So let's go back. In the 70s, Hart put together a truly impressive run of four U.S. Top 20 albums in a matter of just a few years. Beginning with the classic Dreamboat Annie in 1975 and then closing out with Dog and Butterfly in 78. Hart, consisting of Ann Wilson on lead vocals, uh, Nancy Wilson on guitar, there's Roger Fisher on guitar, Howard Lee on guitar, Steve Fossen on bass, and Michael DeRozier on drums. They kicked out three top 15 entries during this time, Magic Man, Barracuda, and straight on. And these songs were so much bigger than their chart positions. I mean, Magic Man and Barracuda, they're classics of all time, played on classic rock radio every day. I also have to mention some of their lower charting songs that were just as iconic, songs like Crazy on You, Heartless, and Dog and Butterfly. Uh, they've all become essential entries into the great American songbook. Dog and Butterfly. However, beginning with Roger Fisher's departure that happened in 1979, the beginning of the next decade it would be a, a totally different story for the band. Now, Hart's 1980 album, Baby Lestrange, that was released to mixed reviews. It was a departure from the, the heavier stadium rock that had made them stars. And, you know, some reviewers suggested the record really suffered due to Fisher's absence. That's what they said back then. The album's lead single, Even It Up, went top 40, and the album peaked at number five, but neither was enough to counter the record's disappointing sales. Baby Lestrange... It became Hart's first album to only certify gold by the RIAA. That had never happened to these guys. That's an achievement a lot of bands, you know, they'd be thrilled for. But for Hart, who had never scored less than a platinum in the 70s, it was a bit of a warning sign. And really, things didn't get much better from there. I mean, 1983's Private Audition, that dropped to number 25 on the Billboard 200. It yielded only one Hot 100 single, The Man Is Mine, which was a lukewarm number 33 ranking. And for the first time in six albums, Hart failed to certify even gold in the U.S. Unheard of. Yeah, man is mine. This man is mine. Then before Hart's next album, Passion Works, uh, Steve Fossen and Michael DeRozier, they both left the fold. They were in turn replaced by Mark Andes and uh, Danny Carmasi. However, this revised lineup, it wasn't enough to jumpstart the band's commercial fortunes. And uh, another Hart album failed to meet expectations. Uh, Passion Work single, it was How Can I Refuse? And it did go to number one on the U.S. rock charts. It's a great song. It did stall at number 44 on the Hot 100, though. Again, unheard of for this band. 
The album had a similar split. It went to number four on the U.S. Rock Albums chart, but it only reached number 39 on the Billboard 200. Uh, this was their worst showing yet. And just like Private Audition, sales weren't enough to certify gold in the States. It seemed like Hart was on the ropes. They had officially gone from superstar status to brink of extinction. Just a short time. As a result, they were largely written off by industry tastemakers and by their label, Epic, who allowed their contract to lapse, didn't resign them. Nancy Wilson, uh, in the Wilson sisters' uh, memoirs, Kicking and Dreaming, she had this to say about their early 80s lull. By the middle of 1984, our crash and burn tour was over, and it felt like so was our career. We did what most entertainers do when things languish. We fired our manager, Ken Kinnear. He'd been with us since 1975, and he'd taken us far, but we were without a label, and in some ways without direction, really. We hired HK Management out of Los Angeles and were set up with an English woman named Trudy Green. Any resolve we had left dissolved once we began shopping for a new label, and uh, we struck out. Now, Nancy would go on to say that the band approached five different labels, and they were summarily rejected by every single one. The only record company who was at all interested was Capital, a good label, but they did have some conditions that were tough. Capital was only interested in heart if they were willing to cover other people's songs and or co-write new songs of proven songwriters. Actually, Ann Wilson talked about this, and we'll show it in an interview later. Uh, Capital appointed Ron Nevison to be their producer. Bad menace for Ron Nevison. According to Nancy, he was brash, he was arrogant, and he was highly opinionated. But despite that, the band, they actually liked him. Plus, he had engineered Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti, so that was a, a big plus. Capital had originally hired Ron to produce a few singles, but once the band met with him, they decided that he was the guy to do, you know, the entire album. Now, recording took place, uh, I believe, between uh, January and April of 1985. It started at the record plant in L.A., and then they moved to the plant in Sausalito, California. Now, according to Nancy, they wanted to get away from the influences of L.A., you know. Now, up to this point, Hart had written most of their own songs. However, per capital stipulations, that was going to change. For the first time in their careers, the Wilson sisters worked extensively with songwriters from outside the group. Now, the bright side was that the band would enlist a talented cast of characters. There was Jim Balance, who had worked extensively with Brian Adams, who was hitting it big with Reckless at the time. The famed Holly Knight, who penned a number of notable 80s hits uh, for you know Pat Benatar and many others, Tina Turner. Mark Mueller, whose songs landed on Golden Platinum Records for four straight decades as well. Most notably, though, for today's episode, uh, the highly celebrated Bernie Toppin and the great Martin Page, they, uh, they wrote today's featured track, These Dreams. Uh, we're going to get into that in a second, including an interview. Another first for the band was the appearance of special guest musicians. There was a Starship's Grace Slick and Mickey Thomas, there were survivors Frankie Sullivan and Johnny Cola from uh, Huey Lewis in the News. The combination of these top-tier songwriters, these guest musicians, and of course the ever-talented Hard, it really made this album a no-lose proposition, especially being released in 85. It was a collaboration of titans. However, according to Ann Wilson, when it came time to put the album together, there was some heated debate over what songs to include. A lot of demos were traded back and forth. That's how it was back in the 80s, so many songs. Some songs took some real convincing to try out for the band. Others were outright rejected because Ann just didn't like them. She had to sing them. And of course, Hart included some of their own compositions as well. But in the end, what was left standing was a powerhouse selection of unforgettable 80s rockers and power ballads. Uh, this would ensure Hart's total comeback into music. And in turn, it, it uh, made them one of the most successful rock acts of the entire decade of the 80s. Uh, Hart, the album, that was released on uh, June 21st, 1985, and half the tracks were released as singles. There were five in all. What About Love? Never. These Dreams? Nothing at all. And If Looks Could Kill. But there's something that you forgot. So 
So let's jump into today's featured song, These Dreams, of course, co-written by Bernie Toppin and Martin Page. Toppin, of course, famous for being Elton John's lyricist, his right-hand man. However, by the mid-'80s, uh, Toppin had gravitated outside of Elton's orbit. His two biggest hits from this period were both composed alongside Martin Page, who would have quite the career of his own. By the way, that other hit song was We Built This City, which scored Starship a number one ranking on the Billboard Hot 100. We actually just cover that. We built this city on rock and roll. So initially, These Dreams was titled Boys in the Mist. I guess Toppin wrote the lyrics for Stevie Nicks with you know, a dreamlike feel that was typical of her catalog. However, Stevie Nicks turned the song down, so Martin Page composed the music and he changed up the title. Now, after Nicks passed on this song, These Dreams, it was actually offered to Kim Carnes, Miss Betty Davis Eyes. She got Betty Davis Eyes. Whom, you know, Page had previously written for. Although Carnes liked These Dreams, she just didn't feel like it was a good match vocally. Which surprises me, I think it would sounded good. She passed as well. From there, the song found its way to heart, said Ann Wilson about it. These Dreams was a gem that Ron Nevison brought to us. His manager had handed him a cassette that contained two songs by Bernie Toppin and Martin Page. There was We Built This City and These Dreams. Now, the first song went to Starship, but Ron had grabbed These Dreams thinking it would work for Nancy, actually. It was really a song Nancy could have written herself. So before we get further into these details on uh, These Dreams... I had the opportunity to sit down with both Martin Page and Ann Wilson, talk about this song. Let me share with you what they had to say about it. He said, let me give you two lyrics uh, to try. And the first two lyrics he gave me Jeez. were We Built This City and These Dreams. Another number one hit, Hart's first number one hit. Very fortunate that those were the first two lyrics he sent me and that we had two number one. It actually made, I think, Bernie go like, oh, I'm on to something here. And it kept us together for a number of years, which was really great. We listened to piles and piles of other people's songs, you know, L.A. songwriter pool songs. And plus, we were still writing our own. But the songs we were writing were just not, they weren't what was the excess of the 80s. wanted. We were sounding antique at this point. We weren't changing with the t or being ahead of the times. We weren't out there in front. And um, this was the moment where we thought, well, this is probably going to be it. The excess of the 80s yeah, kind of yeah. came in. Yeah. It's so interesting how things change so quickly in the music industry. Yeah, and sometimes it's slow and gradual, and sometimes it's tsunami. In the 80s, it was kind of like a weird crystallization into um, phoniness. I mean, lots of people will hate me for saying that because they no. love the 80s. They love the whole... Thing. Well, I love it because that's when I grew up and I was discovering this music. Right, but yeah. MTV, I mean, was a big step in helping people from Idaho. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Idaho, yeah. so that was my window to the world, you know? Yeah. But I understand what you're saying, absolutely. And some of the music was gorgeous. The police, I mean, some amazing things came out of that era. But also some really inauthentic Excess. bullshit came out of that. Yep. Excess. Like Nancy always says, the... The type of drugs that were popular <laughs> then even got <laughs> egocentric. Right. Luckily, These Dreams. Oh, yeah. Which great is a song. great song. These Dreams was a 10-minute song. Yeah. I literally wrote it in Jeez. 10 minutes. Uh, and it always sticks in my mind because when I wrote with Robbie Robertson on a song called Four and Angel, it took mm. over a year. Because when people say, well, how is it to write a song? I say, you can never really plan it. It's either going to happen straight away or some, you get a glimpse and then it uh, takes a long time. So these dreams I remember as being ridiculously fast. Yeah. And I can remember writing in a little flat in L.A. and so excited about harmonically how the melody was that I picked up the phone and played it to Diane as I was singing it down the phone and playing the chords because it just wrote it i mean it sounds cliche but it came very very quick i mean it's one of those things when i now if anybody asked me they'd say what are your favorite songs i'd say probably musically that these dreams uh hits all the knobs for me i'm yeah. i'm pleased with how um harmonically that song turned out From dreams in the mist. these dreams was the only song of the album on which nancy wilson sang lead vocals she didn't do it very often when you got ann wilson there's no need 
Uh, she, of course, handled lead vocals all the time. But when the band heard this demo, everybody thought it suited Nancy better. Anne actually tried singing a verse when they first got it, but it just didn't work for her voice. Later on in their career, you know, Anne did sing it a few times, but still wasn't a great fit, as they say. Said Anne, once on stage when we were bored and trying to shake things up, I tackled it again, but I had to change the key to get through it. It just didn't break with my voice the right way. It was Nancy's song from the very start. And a quote. Spare a little candle, save some light for me. Nevison didn't have to work very hard to convince Nancy to do it, actually. She said she knew it was a great song, and being an Elton John fanatic, she, of course, loved everything that Bernie did. Only get this, Nancy actually had a nasty cold when she first recorded her vocals. It's pretty rough. But it actually worked to her favor. Even though her voice cracked at the high parts, Nevison, he liked the rasp of it. A couple of months later, after Nancy had recovered, they actually recorded the vocals again. And Nancy tried her best to recreate that uh, under the weather sound, but it just wasn't the same. It wasn't as natural. So they, they left it. Ron joked that, you know, Nancy needed to get sick again to sing it. Her healthy voice it just wasn't that rawness. Ultimately, Nevison convinced Nancy to let him use the original. Wasn't a perfect take, but it was full of emotion. It was really brilliant. Sadly, I don't think that sort of vocal creativity would ever be allowed to happen again. They would definitely auto-tune it. I can't resist. Also, during the sessions, Hart received a letter from the family of a young fan named Sharon Hess. Now, Sharon, uh, she was actually dying of leukemia, and one of her last wishes was to meet her favorite band. So arrangements were made for a studio visit. The day Sharon arrived, Nancy was recording that first vocal run through of these dreams. Nancy described Sharon as a feisty 22-year-old who was bravely fighting this horrible disease. She said it was very emotional having her there in the studio. The song is silence that I've ever heard. Sharon absolutely fell in love with the song These Dreams. So in the liner notes, Nancy actually dedicated the song to her young friend. Said Nancy, every time I sing it, I think about her. She died only a few days after we finished the final mixes. She was actually buried wearing a heart t-shirt and cap and with her favorite guitar in her arms. It's just the way I'd want to go out. That's what she said. Now these dreams was Hart's first Hot 100 number one. One of only two that the band had, Alone followed the next year. It's hard to believe they only hit number one twice with all the classics that they've had. Uh, these Dreams also went to number one on the Cashbox chart and the Adult Contemporary chart, and it reached number two on the Mainstream Rock chart. Definitely a triple threat, as they say. Unfortunately, it had less success internationally. Surprisingly, it stalled at number 62 in the UK. Only went to number 30 in Ireland and number 27 in Australia. However, it did climb to number six in Canada, and it did go to number one on Canada's adult contemporary chart. Now, since its charting days, you know, back in the 80s, These Dreams has appeared in a handful of movies and TV shows, including uh, The Campaign, Family Guy, Brian Wilson Bio uh, Love and Mercy. Uh, there was The Nest in the Dark and Black Monday. In a way you can dreamily digest. These dreams go on. As far as covers go, these dreams, it's really underrepresented. In my research, I was only able to find covers by Styx and Panic at the Disco. But I'd be really surprised if that's all there is. There's got to be more out there. Let me know if you know of any in the comments. As the years have passed, these dreams has become a staple on just about every greatest hits and live album Hart has ever released. For example, you can find it on 1995's The Road Home, the aptly named These Dreams in 1997, it's 2002's The Essential Heart, and 2003's Alive in Seattle, just to name a few. Also, These Dreams has tallied more than 200 million streams on YouTube and Spotify, making it one of Hart's most popular songs. I live life, these dreams. Now, by the time These Dreams reached the top of the charts, the Hart comeback was already going full force, actually. Two other singles had previously reached the top 10. What About Love went to number 10, 
and never climbed all the way to number four. The album quickly scaled the charts as well, ultimately claiming number one bragging rights. They actually go on to sell over five million copies. Some actually have it at six million. Actually makes it the biggest selling hard album of all time. Nancy reflected saying, just a year before Ann and I had been adrift in our career without a record label. Even I, a question of heart, had passed our expiration date. Our first success had been so rooted, you know, in the original lineup of the band and in the 70s. We just wondered if we were ever to break free. But when Heart became our biggest album ever, it felt like we had a new life without baggage. It was a phenomenal resurgence, but the band's prosperity, it didn't end there. Hart's follow-up, uh, Bad Animals, that was released a couple years later in 87, that was a smash hit as well. It went to number two on the Billboard 200, and it delivered another three hit singles, including the aforementioned number one song, Alone. Phenomenal vocal performance by Ann there. Um, and they were back on top. Even in the 90s, Brigade continued to keep the streak alive. That one went to number three, and it featured the Mutt Lane co-written track, All I Want to Do Is Make Love To You, that went to number two, and uh, not a favorite of the band's. <laughs> all in all, though, from 1985 to 1990, Hart would release a barrage of 80s rock classics that killed it on the Hot 100 on the charts. There were seven top 10 hits, a number two, and two number ones. And between their three albums, they sold over 13 million copies. How's that for a comeback? Well, I mean, we are talking about Heart, one of the greatest bands ever. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Heart and these dreams. What are your memories of this song? What do you think about... Uh, their output in the 80s versus the 70s versus the 90s. What's your favorite uh, era of heart? What do you think? Is Ann Wilson the greatest ever? I think she's, <laughs> for me, she is the greatest female vocalist. Let's have a great uh, discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.